Hey, welcome back to the second part of our Space Explorers episode, all to do with space engineers and Mars and Dr. Manish Patel, who is still here. Again. Haven't released you yet, Manish. Still here. <laughs> so what we're going to do now... We haven't resuscitated with cake in the intervening period. <laughs> yeah, we well, did. you can't see is the chain down here. <laughs> Help. It's because the, <laughs> the chain is green, like the green screen. It's magic. Um, but what we have done before we let you go is we've got questions um, from the audience, from you guys watching at home. Um, so if you asked a question in a few videos ago, and actually it was in the comments section of the Dr. Matt Bam video. If you had a question there, then stay tuned because we may be about to read it out. Uh, we've, we've wheeled it down to six great questions, Lewis. I'm, I'm confident that these are going to stretch. I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to hearing what the answers these Manish's are. Stretch yeah. mind to the very limits. Uh, now he's looking concerned again. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not break him. Um, so let's let's fire straight in. So our first question, Manish, comes from user who's known as Sheepy X Tales. When we begin to live on Mars, also I love the assumption that we will. That's that's really positive, <laughs> that's thinking. positive so, thinking. When we begin to live on Mars, if we evolve to a point where we could breathe, what would we inhale and what would we exhale? So I guess what Sheepy X Tales is a- is asking is, you know, could there be a point when we can live on the surface of Mars? Um, and actually, you know, without the need for a space suit. I guess suit, how would we do that? Yeah, for that, without the need for a space suit and, or a habitat, is, is there a future where we could get there? Uh, there is. In science fiction, there always has been. We're, we're gradually getting more and more towards it not being science fiction, which is great. Uh, so we can't really change us so much. Uh, we can't change people so much, but we can, we can influence the environment on Mars. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you can do is this thing called terraforming, where you, you can... You can make the atmosphere thicker and add gases that we need to breathe in in the atmosphere of Mars. So releasing things like water vapor, oxygen, etc. into the atmosphere. That's the kind of thing we could do in order mm-hmm. to maybe live there out on the surface without, without is there, the need Is there any idea how long that would take to, to terraform an entire... I mean, that's kind of what we're already doing to Earth, right? We're terraforming to make it more hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're just doing <laughs> it. I guess yeah. we need to do the same <laughs> with Mars. I mean, it's quite cold now, so a bit of global warming on Mars would be a good thing. Exactly. So um, we it, it takes time. These kind of things can't be done quickly. It's got a massive amount of, of, of gas there. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, what, it's not just some guy going around with a bag and going, no. here! Like, how, how, would you, how would you actually... Is, is there any? Has anyone proposed theories for how you might deliver a huge amount of, of various gases to you know to make well, to make a, a planet wide difference? Science fiction writers have been thinking about this for a long time, um, and you know there are stories about Mars where you could melt all the ice. There's a lot of ice in the subsurface of Mars. If you can find a way to melt that, you're suddenly releasing a lot of, of and it's water, water the ice air. on the poles. There's carbon dioxide ice. There's atmosphere frozen Absolutely. onto the ground, ready to go. Absolutely, every winter. Quite a lot of the atmosphere condenses down and freezes onto the surface at the, at the poles as well, the CO2. So, yeah, if you heat that up as well, you've got even more atmosphere. So, there, so there are ways of doing basically it. basically talking about nuking the polar ice caps on Mars. That's one <laughs> way of doing it. That's one That's way approach. of doing it. Is, it, is this an ESA sanctioned approach? Um. Possibly not yet. Possibly not that's, yet. That's the hammer for the needle kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, you might might want to think about other ways, but essentially doing that, making it nice and hot, will, will is okay. a way to All do right. it. All right, great, great question. Uh, so um, next question yes. from Pierre Fouquet. And uh, Pierre would like to know, as I understand it, you'd be able to light a blue torch in space. But due to space being very cold, in fact has zero heat, uh, bad science puns are good, he says, uh, would it even be able to melt metal to form the world? What do you know about that? Right, so the you're right. The um, the the welding torch would work. A blowtorch wouldn't work, but a welding torch uh, would work because you you have all the gases there. You need to react. So it's just like a rocket motor itself, isn't it? You've got the, you've got the fuel, you've got the oxygen. That's mixed exactly together. how a rocket thruster works. You mix the gases you need and you light them. That's that's how it works. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it would probably work better than than. On, than on Earth, because so you're saying that Pierre is a liar. Not to <laughs> of the Wait, Open University. You're calling <laughs> Pierre Fouquet a liar. No, um, so I, I guess because he, he's implying here that um, so he's saying that space is cold, which is right, yes. isn't it? Space, space is a nippy place. Space is is very very cold. You think it's cold when you get out, you know, on the winter's day and go down the shops? <laughs> it's it's a lot colder. Space than is that. colder than winter. It is All certainly right. they're colder than winter. <laughs> but the great thing about space is that because there's no atmosphere, there's nowhere for the heat to go. Yeah, uh, it can't radiate away. So if you heat something up, it stays hot. Uh, so using a welding piece in space, you would. It will be cold, but when you heat it, the heat can't escape okay. anywhere. So you can actually. So actually, welding in space might be easier than welding on Earth. 
with the atmosphere? Possibly, possibly. Possibly. There's a lot of other factors, but you can certainly, you should certainly be able to do it. Sure. Which is which is something which we're doing in in Space Engineers in, in this game where we, mm, we're yes. melding different space cars. Oh space yes, cars, and so. crashing spaceships. So when you're when you're building things like the International Space Station, it's not launched as a whole thing from Earth. Different components, modules are launched and then assembled in space. It's not welds that we use to attach them. Uh, to it? Typically, is it just nuts and bolts? no. Typically, you go for a mechanical f connection. It's much uh, easier to repair. It's easier to do in space and as you know, well. It it's works less. Well. It works well, yeah. and yeah, let's face it, you haven't got a lethal weapon in your hand <laughs> when you're flailing <laughs> about. In when you space, get the space madness so and go on a space ex murder, <laughs> murder spree. Exactly. So the next question is from Tenth X Ten, and they ask. Would solar sails using photons as propulsion actually work in deep space, or are they just crazy sci-fi fantasy? So, yeah, I mean, how how good are solar sails as a way of, of moving around? Uh, how do they work? Would they work? So, uh, solar sails are great in that they're they're almost free transport energies. You have a big a big thin sail, and it uses the the momentum of a photon, so a particle of light hitting it, to just push it along slightly. Now. It, a photon weighs nothing and the momentum impact is tiny but the great thing is there's millions upon millions there's of lots billions of, of the these things yeah the, 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 there's swarms of these things everywhere um, so that makes up for the fact that they have very little push so by, mm. by having loads of them you can build up this 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 sail kind away. of like how a blue whale can survive on tiny plankton exactly <laughs> right? there great, you great, great analogy science great analogy, analogy for you, you so go. these solar cells are essentially great big flimsy mirrors I guess aren't they you want to reflect the photons back Yep. Back the way they came. Yep. Get back to where you come from. And back have, to <laughs> ha have we have we used them? Uh, is, is, uh, have, have you know has mankind launched craft which use this as a way of moving around? They've been tested in space for a concept, but never used on a, on a mission mm. as per okay. se. So you need huge, huge sails to to generate uh, enough push to even move a small object. So if you're in deep space, tenth uh, x ten is absolutely correct in that it'll be so much harder in deep space because the the overall photon flux, uh, the number of photons hitting you is smaller, uh -huh. but you can get around it. You just need a bigger sail. Yeah, we're going to need a bigger sail type thing. So, there's so, been other ideas as well, hasn't there? To You can use the sunlight, but only when you're close to the sun, when you're within the solar system or yep. flying into interstellar space. But I guess you could create artificial photons and shine them at your solar cell. So use a, <laughs> a whopping great big laser. Absolutely. In space. But, it, but then how do you power the laser, though? Surely that's... You have to power it from Earth with a great... But I really like this idea of, um, for transport because who doesn't want to build a massive space laser and no shoot one. it? Oh, right. So, so you're basically... So, so, so if I'm going on this trip, I climb aboard a ship and then you shoot the ship with a giant laser yep. and that's meant to make it move. Yep, this that's is amazing. a serious concept that's that great. is being studied by NASA and ESA. Wow. Uh, and our next question is from Colin Brown. And Colin would like to know that if you met a cute alien, Manish... Would you take them on a nice date? <laughs> my answer would have <laughs> to be yes. Words, my you? answer would have to be yes. And and it, and it doesn't matter what they look like. I look for what's inside, Lewis, and that's what really matters. Do you, do you go all the way on a, on a space first date? <laughs> Only with an alien. <laughs> I, I like how, I like how um, Colin Brown qualifies a nice date as opposed to an awful date. Oh, well, yeah, that's you an know? option. That is, yeah, I mean, <laughs> why would you ever deliberately take someone on a bad date, Colin? Hey, eh? and it's a lot of questions you got to ask yourself here, mate. Uh, anyway, next question uh, is from Hagen Armstrong, who says, "Where is North or South on Mars when it does not have a magnetic field?" So, this is yeah, good, good question. question. Good, good question. question. Yeah, Mars. Mars doesn't have a strong magnetic field, uh, so it's not protected like the Earth is from all the all the horrible stuff in space. Mm. It does, however, have a very weak remnant, an old magnetic field. So it used to, back in the good old days, it did used to have a magnetic field when things were still happening inside Mars. We think as it cooled down, got a bit colder, the magnetic field stopped, but we can still kind of just see traces of this in, 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 the, in the surface and below the surface. It's almost like the mag Sorry, man, it's almost like the magnetic field's been trapped in the kind of iron crust in, in, the, in the southern highlands, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but you can still tell north and south. You can infer it from the spin of the planet, which mm. is similar to the Or the stars, and, I guess. And everything, you yes. You can navigate in the same way that ancient seafarers would have been doing on Earth. Yeah. So when you say the good old days, is this, is this the kind of um, idea that billions of years ago, Mars used to be maybe a bit more like Earth is today? Exactly. So we believe that in the past, billions, billions of years ago, Mars had a much thicker atmosphere. It was a much warmer planet um, when it was younger. So normally people get fatter as they get older. It's the opposite <laughs> way for Mars. It's getting thinner. So back when it had a thick atmosphere, it was warm. Tectonically, it was still active. 
there was a lot of things going in going on inside the planet and that would have that would have meant it would have had a magnetic field back back in those days so i mean is it fair is it fair to say that mars is now geologically dead or is it is that still kind of up in the air is that basically what one of the things that you are hoping to find out yeah absolutely it's not geologically active it's not very active at the moment so we don't see volcanoes erupting we don't see plates moving around like we do on earth but we don't believe it's geologically dead there may still be some some things going on there's actually uh so we're going to be looking for gases that are volcanic in origin so if we see so2 in the atmosphere of mars we'll know that there's maybe something going on some very low level tectonic so activity. That, that's sulfur dioxide that's the, the kind of gas Sorry, given yes. off by volcanic eruption sulfur dioxide if you see sulfur dioxide on earth it comes pretty much from from volcanic uh sources there's also a NASA lander going in 2018 called InSight, which is going to carry a seismometer, and that's actually going to look and listen for Mars quakes. Mars quakes. Uh, wow. That's awesome. Well, is, that will answer the question whether it's geologically I had no dead I- or not. I had no idea that Mars quakes was even a potential thing. It is really potential, but we don't know if it is or not. So the final question, Manish, I think is very well suited for you, actually. And it's, it's from a user Boondog, who says, What does methane smell like in space? Good question. Multi-layered, <laughs> many aspects Good of that question. question. So um, we're going to be sniffing for methane on Mars, but we're actually going to be sniffing for it with our eyes. So we are... That's yeah, never so going to work. So how does that work then? Manage, that's a terrible this. idea. You already that's have a- an organ <laughs> designed for smelling. <laughs> Why would you use your so eyes? What we're going to do is look at the sunlight that's absorbed in the atmosphere of Mars, and that's how we kind of sniff for methane, if you like, in the atmosphere without actually going in there. Smelling stuff in space is incredibly difficult. Because there's no atmosphere, there's no way to breathe. So you wouldn't want to be taking your, your space helmet off in the first place. Would whatever you? you do, no matter how tempting it is, don't take your helmet off and go, because you won't. Well, you'll be dead. Um, <laughs> but but methane itself doesn't have a strong smell actually. And then you know, the reason they they what it smell the stuff that comes out of your cooker they actually add things to it so you can smell it. So that if well, if it, if it does leak in your house, you can smell it. But it doesn't smell like a lot, I'm afraid. Ah, well, there you go. Great questions. Learn something every day. Absolutely. Well, Manish, thank you very much for fielding those questions. Some of them were actually really good. Um, not that I would ever doubt it to your <laughs> questionability. <laughs> and you can prove me right yet again because we, of course, have many more episodes to go. And in fact, we're taking questions now for not the next episode, but the one after that because we've recorded them in a funny order. But who is who are we asking for questions for now, Lewis? Which episode? Uh, so we have Abby Hutty coming up to play uh, Kerbal Space Program yes. with us. So yes. if you have any questions about that game or Abby who is she's a literal rocket scientist she has one of the most exciting jobs out of all the people I know and she helps design the spacecraft that we send to Mars and importantly land gently on the surface of Mars (laughs) and and drive around and explore the rad planet for us so watch that next video absolutely and send us the questions that you have for Abby Hutty Yes, now if you watched it, um, obviously you watched it because that's why you're here, but the first part, um, you will notice that A, I was terrible at building spacecraft, and B, I did fly spacecraft directly into the Martian <laughs> surface. So I really think Abby's going to bring us on leaps and bounds. Yes, so help, us, so help us a little bit there. And there's also a game that you guys have requested a lot, actually, is Kerbal Space Program. So if you have any questions about, about you know how to do that in real life, then put them in the comments uh, section of this video right now, and we will we will ask them. And thank you again for coming and chatting with us, Manish. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Cheers. great to have you here. Well, oh, actually, Manish, if uh, people want to find out more about what you're doing, is there anywhere they could go? Can they follow you on Twitter or anything like that? Uh, look me up on the Open University website. It's probably the best thing. I'm hideously archaic in that I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't know how I've how made How did you it, ever get any work done, Manish? I don't know. I have no idea what's going on in the world. <laughs> Literally no uh, idea so what's going on. you're an Instagram going. guy. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so Open University, Dr. Manish Patel, and they can find you and more about what you're doing. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time for more Space Explorers.